Hello, 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 Filter Free America listeners. Welcome back to the show. I am so glad that we're back together again in our little, I don't know, cult of communication. Is that is that what this is? A cult of communication? And we're like, uh, we sacrifice uh, electronics, communication devices uh, to our God. And our God would be, who would our God be? in a cult of communication. Would it be, it couldn't be somebody like, eh, it's not going to be like Rogan. It can't be somebody, it's got to be somebody like uh, bigger. What's a, who's like the most of uh, uh, well-known communicator, radio personality, communication. Oh, God, who would that be? That's hard to think of. I got, I'm, let's see. Andy Rooney. Andy Rooney. That's what it is. Our, we're, we're a cult of communication. And, and the God that we sacrifice our electronic communication device to is Andy Rooney. Pretty sure he's dead. I might have to look that up later. Um, should we go with dead? Let's go with dead right now. Andy Rooney is dead, and he is our God. He is who we, we, we pray to here at the Filter Free America podcast. I'm pretty sure Andy Rooney uh, would hate my father. <laughs> Podcast. He doesn't seem like somebody talks about dicks and jerking off a lot. So I don't know if if I would be his bag. Uh, so it is what it is. But in getting anyway, uh, back, welcome to the show. Glad you guys are back. Uh, my audio, my earphones is really weird right now. Okay, let's try it like that. Ah, that's better. Um, y- yeah, welcome back to the show. We got a very very cool podcast this episode. Especially cool if you're in to money. Do you like money? Do you like like piles of cash? Do you like fast cars, fast times, and faster women? Of course you do. Even the ladies like faster women. Whatever. Uh, you know, we, we've done a lot of episodes, you know, because it is an area of expertise for me on poverty. So we tried to flip the script right now. And I had a, a wealthy individual sit down across from me and 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 talk to me. I'm sure he was losing money with every minute that he sat here talking to me, he was probably losing thousands and thousands of dollars just by, you know, giving me his time and letting some idiot ramble and talk to him. And he had to educate me on his stuff. Uh, who are we talking to? The gentleman's name is Colin LaHaye. Uh, what does he do? He is a venture capitalist, a Bitcoin trader, and a full-time day trader. That's right. He's a, he's made money off of Bitcoin. He's one of those people that, that uh, you never, ever get to meet you're like, oh, I've got these bitcoins, and eventually there's going to be some money. No, 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 no. This dude made money off of Bitcoin. He got in at the right time, learned how to trade it and do all the little magic stuff that he tells us about in the podcast, right? And then, and then he cashed out, right? He got some money, right? So much so, so much so that he drove a car to my house that was worth literally as much as my house, Right? He brought a quarter million dollar Lamborghini was parked in my driveway next to my my uh five thousand dollar crown Victoria <laughs> and it was it was stunning to look at it it, it was uh it, it was amazing to see that 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 uh that scale of low end to high end automotive parked right next to each other it was i I felt like it was my house and my driveway and I felt like I was insulting his car by having my other one of my cars too close to his car, that kind of thing, right? Beautiful orange red Lamborghini that he even gave me a ride in after the fact. And holy fuck, right? Like like my my SHO is a pretty fast car as far as four door three thousand, four thousand pound cars go. Uh it's pretty fast, right? But the Lamborghini, uh the, that's insane, right? It's it's zero to sixty in like less than three seconds. And it's a it's a monster, right? But that's what you get. That's the reward for doing the kind of work that this gentleman does, right? He's he's clearly a brilliant individual. Uh, he he invests, he, and he and he tells you, you know, in the in the podcast. But he's he's not a he's not like a like a get a tip, make an investment, and hope it pays out. He's one of these guys who's got the brain capacity uh, to to analyze trends and numbers and things like that, and he makes calculated decisions uh, that uh, clearly uh, end in profit, right? That's what happens, right? When you're, when you're a smart individual, so I hear, uh, 
you, <laughs> you use your brain power and uh, you get money. That's, that's, uh, that's how it works. I uh, should have stayed in school. But whatever, that's what we're going to talk to. And uh, just, just basic stuff. I'm not going to get, we didn't get too deep and just fine. I didn't want to ask him, uh, you know, like, how much money do you have? I didn't ever, I never asked that question. Uh, uh, number one, I, that's, that's his business. I don't want to, you know, I didn't know if that would be something that needed to be asked in this, in this conversation, which it didn't. Right. And then plus I just didn't want to feel bad the rest of the night. It was like, oh, you know, I got 10, 12 million, something like that. I would have probably cut my wrists. Uh, and uh, had to borrow money to buy the razor blade to do so. But that's who we're talking to. And he tells me, you know, uh, the, kind of uh, how he got into it, uh, you know, how how he made it work for him, uh, all, all the little secrets of, of, uh, of trading, I guess. So it was a very interesting conversation. And the whole time I'm sitting over here, I'm like, God, this guy is so much smarter than me. He deserves all the money. Like he... he like I felt so dumb talking to him <laughs> that I wanted to give him my money. Like I felt like like this, the, whatever I had in my pocket at the time, probably under a hundred dollars. I just wanted to give it to him and say, "Look, I don't deserve this money because you clearly you deserve this money." So that's what it is. But he's a super cool dude too, man. And he's like, "Yeah, man, let's go for a ride and rode rode in the Lamborghini." Did I already mention that? I had to mention that one more time because it was very nice. But he's gonna let me ride again this summer, you know, when it gets a little bit warmer. And uh, go out and do some really fast driving in the Lambo, in the Lambo. But anyway, it's, this is not anything about Lamborghinis. This is all about uh, how this guy invested in this cryptocurrency. And now he's a baller. He's a baller, down to earth, cool dude, baller. But he's a baller nonetheless, right? You just know it, you know? He just carries himself with that uh, that baller mystique. He's like, I could probably pay to have you killed. I mean, he didn't say that, but that was what his image projected, right? But still, very nice guy, very mellow guy. I'm embellishing a little bit, you know, got to have a little theatrics here at the Filter Free America communication cult, right? Whatever. It was a fantastic conversation, and I really appreciate it. So that's what we're talking about there. Uh, real fast, I mentioned to my sponsor, my one and only sponsor, uh, Simple Website. Dot .us, simplewebsite.us, and as everyone knows, we say it three times, Simple Website. Dot .us. What is that? You might ask if you've never listened to this show before, are you really into advertisement? Well, I'll tell you what it is. Simplewebsite.us is the place that you need to go if you want help building a Squarespace website. Now, wait, I already hear you saying, wait a minute, Joey. Squarespace is designed for people to do it on their own. Yeah. Well, in, in most cases, that is true. That is, right? Now, for an example, if you're in my case and you're dumb as a box of rocks, uh, no, you're not going to make a nice looking website there, right? You couldn't do it. I mean, if you waited, you know, a few years and you, you played with it and tinkered with it, maybe you would come up with something GeoCity-esque, right? Maybe, but not me, right? So that's would be their, probably a lot of their clientele is people just don't want to sit and figure it out like me, right? But you don't have to be dumb as me to use their services, not at all, right? Say you're say you're like our guest, Colin LaHaye, and you're bawling out of your mind, right? And you want more free time to drive your Lamborghini, right? Because you want to drive the Lamborghini. That's why you get the Lamborghini, to drive the Lamborghini. Did I mention that he put almost 10,000 miles on his Lamborghini the first year that he owned it? I'm just saying, most people don't do that. That's how baller he is. Like, I'm going to buy this car, I'm going to drive the shit out of it. But regardless, back to the advertisement. Um... It, if say you want to to drive your Lamborghini more, you want free time, right? You don't want to invest time in building the website. So that's why you would call somebody like simplewebsite.us. You say, hey, look, I'm busy uh, driving Lamborghinis. Uh, can you build me a website about driving Lamborghinis? And simplewebsite.us will do that, right? It's a, it's a great service, okay? Even if you want to do it on your own, regardless if you have Lambo driving or not to do, okay? Go to their website anyway. Go to simplewebsite.us and look around a little bit because what you will find there, aside for them giving the pitch of what they can do for you, you're going to find some free tips and tricks that you can just take for, as the name implies, free, right? No money involved. You just go and you get the free tips and tricks. You're like, I'm out of here. I'm gone. Bye. Simplewebsite.us. Support them. They support us. Uh, anything else I need to mention? I don't think there is anything else I need to mention right now. Let's just jump into the website. Get or jump into the website. Ah, oh, brain fart. Jump into the episode talking to Mr. LaHaye 
about how he made money with Bitcoin, but I guess I need a title. I need a name for this, right? Oh, dude, this is, oh, it writes itself. I'm a Bitcoin baller with Colin LaHaye. That's it. That's golden. That's money. That's it. That is, to me, like his many millions of dollars, I assume that he has. Me scoring that easily to write title is the most wealth that I'll ever experience in my life. So here we go. I'm a Bitcoin baller with Colin LaHaye right here on the Filter Free America podcast. Let's go. All right. So why don't you start by telling me what draw, well, I assume making money easily is, is usually the, the number one draw, but what brought you into investing? Were you, was it interesting to you on a, on, a, on a deeper level than just making cash? Or Yeah, I originally got into it, obviously for the money, but also for the freedom. So in high school, I was doing um, search engine optimization, search engine marketing, like advertising on Google. Um, Facebook didn't exist at the time or wasn't big, but just kind of getting into the data analytics and seeing what people were clicking on and how to get them into buying products. So that kind of mindset transferred pretty well to financial products. So I went to school um, in River Falls, right across the border, um, for advertise or sorry for a business administration and marketing. And then that kind of um, got me a job right out of college at Medtronic, the Fortune 500 or Fortune 200 or whatnot. And then from there, it was just kind of a hobby where I could use the same mindset at work and go, oh, I can just trade, you know, part time on my phone or whatnot. And that kind of evolved from doing it maybe you know two hours, three hours a week to okay, I'm putting a little bit too much time at work doing into this. I should probably, you know, um, focus on my actual job here. But ultimately, I went the other route with it. So most people kind of go to Medtronic. It's kind of a work there for 40 years and then retire. I kind of did the opposite. So I got out of there after a year because the part-time hobby was kind of taking over. And then I just kind of went full-time. And I was doing it part-time since 2012. And then I kind of jumped in full-time at the end of 2014 and have been doing it full-time since then. Okay. So... Explain to me this, going back to what you originally said, you said you were kind of doing, uh, understanding, you know, how clicks work as far as the internet goes, pre-Google and all that. Is that, is that system or is it, is it a pattern thing that you're looking for? And then how does that translate into, inv- what I'm asking you, well, what's like the secret sauce of investing, I guess, and is from, at least from this context. Sure. Um, so the big thing for me was data analytics. So seeing one side of things from the marketing perspective and what people were buying and why they were searching for things that would lead to conversion rates that kind of mindset was the same as seeing charts um, for how price patterns moving, how price action is kind of doing on a daily basis, um, the fluctuations and how news affects things. And that kind of um, was on a similar line. So even though it wasn't really what I went to school for, um, the mentality and the mindset was still the same. You said something there that that grabbed my attention, like how the news affects. You're talking about buying and and selling of of, of positions. See, that's interesting to me because I was – I don't know if you've ever listened to this podcast or not. I have a healthy uh, conspiratorial mind. So I always wonder, it's like if you – if large corporations uh, who are that are publicly traded, you know, do they put news out in the world to intentionally motivate investors or things like that? And Yeah, absolutely. So just to kind of jump in there yeah. – um, Every market is going to be manipulated. Insiders are always going to have the information before the general public or even um, the stockholders have that. That's just human nature. Someone's going to have the information first. So the problem is when you're trading just off fundamental, oh, I like Apple. They're a great company. Hopefully they release some good numbers. That's kind of the fundamental view. Um, There's no proper way to trade. You just have to find what works for you and what's consistent. I'm not a fundamental trader. I don't want news to come out. I just like seeing patterns in the charts and what the price action is doing. So I'm what's called a technical trader. So I'll use just a chart of what the price is doing and then i stack indicators support resistance levels and kind of a bunch of data points to kind of see a safer place to enter a position and a safer place to exit and then just kind of adapt so less emotion and more just numbers like real sterile right just betting on on consistency and patterns and so the logical conclusion would be if you have perfected this system wouldn't a computer do it better because the computer can remove a hundred percent of emotion. And that's kind of what Forex and wall street is doing now is just these billion dollar hedge funds that no one's ever heard of the name of them because they're just running in, you know, a secret warehouse that's on a super um, fast connection right next to the um, New York stock exchange. They're making all the money and no one's ever heard of them. Right. Um, I trade the markets that are highly volatile, um, the equivalent of penny stocks, so cryptocurrencies, you know, just stuff that moves a lot and um, far less liquidity in them. Okay. But also there's not enough money where the billion dollar hedge funds, they don't care right now. Um, they'll care in maybe 10 years if it's big and has grown up since then. So there's still room for retail traders trading manually like me. Okay. 
All right. Well, go back then to the beginning and like, what were the areas? Like, did you just like pick some stuff and just try and experiment or did you have like a going into it? I I can tell you, you're you're a smart guy. You've already probably thought about a plan going into it, but what was your, your idea? Just jumped in and throw some money around. And how does that, how does one get started? I guess at first it was just supply and demand. So I read how the technology of Bitcoin works, saw the risks, saw the potential and when you compare anything to the financial markets, it was minuscule. I think it was like $50 billion market cap. I'm just throwing a number in a hat right now. But right. whatever it was back then, it was tiny. And then if it were to succeed, this technology, and it, um, you know, if banks started adopting it and companies started adopting it, it just made sense to me that the price in you know, 10, 20 years is either going to be ridiculously high just because of supply and demand. There's only going to be ever 21 million coins or less than that for Bitcoin um, specifically. And then... If it doesn't work out, it'd be zero. So was, you always know your kind of like your downside risk would be zero. So as you know, it's um, kind, of, kind of cliche to say, but never invest more and you can afford to lose. Right. It was always started that way. And just knowing that the upside was immense. Um, and there's just a lot of room for growth just off purely supply and demand. Um, I never really was into the 100% in the technology. I really don't care if Bitcoin's the big winner, if Ethereum's the big winner, or one we haven't even heard of takes over. I'm just kind of trading the volatility and the price action. Okay. Is Bitcoin, was it the first cryptocurrency? Was that? It was, yeah. Okay. 2008 is when it was started. It, it, can you give me a layman's explanation to me and the, the listeners then? What is it? I mean, I've got an idea of what it is, but I don't, I honestly don't understand much of it at all. Yeah. So. Um, you could Google it and get, you know, way better definitions of it. But my definition is basically, if you think of PayPal, which pretty much everyone in the world kind of knows how to use and how it works, or Venmo. Right. That's a centralized party. So you want to send money to your friend. It has to go through Venmo or PayPal, which would be the centralized party. Um, They can choose to send the transaction back and say, hey, we don't like it. You're from Syria or you're from the U.S. or, you know, you've got bad credits and they can kind of reverse those transactions. Um, Bitcoin uses and the blockchain technology for all the coins. They use a decentralized network. So it's a bunch of nodes, which um, I guess in layman's terms is a bunch of different computers across the world. Right. And they're all sharing in that central, what the centralized party did. They're all sharing in those resources to kind of agree on these transactions happened. This person sent money to this person. Um, these Everything's real kind of. And then every 10 minutes it's updated. And those nodes get rewarded for participating in that process. So every... Um, in Bitcoin's um, case, every 10 minutes on average is when more Bitcoin get released and it's split by who, uh, but split by those nodes. Okay. Is there a, and if, and correct me if I'm wrong, there is, no one knows really the, the identity of who created what Bitcoin is. Is that correct? Right. Yep. So it was started as a white paper, just posted online in some very nerdy kind of um, cryptography kind of mailing list. And he just used the pseudonym Satoshi Nakamoto. So they don't know if it's one person, if it's a team kind of working under that. Um, and, you know, it's unlimited conspiracy theories. So everyone's got their own ideas. Could be, you know, the NSA invented this for a 20-year plan or whatever. Who right. knows? Um, but at the end of the day, a lot of people have looked at a lot of, you know, 10, 11-year-old forum posts kind of trying to figure out who he is, connecting the dots. Um, Newsweek posted a front-page article on we figured out who it was and it was the wrong guy. So <laughs> ultimately, course. no one's figured it out yet. Okay. Well, see that that that's my my fear or my conspiracy theory that I it's like it would be like the perfect like a test run of like a a universal currency that's that's worldwide accepted you know just because it's so flexible in the way that it is, but it also seems like the the perfect way to like bring down people economically like you get a bunch of people excited about this product this new investment angle and they dump all their money in there. And it's to me, and I understand, and I kind of understand the blockchain and the protections and all that. But anything electronic has to have a a point where it could just be erased, right? Or, I mean, am I wrong in at, thinking at that at all? At this point, there's too many nodes for that angle um, okay. all across the world. It's very decentralized now. Um, it's the equivalent of the top 500 supercomputers in the world. Um, it's faster than all of them combined. So I mean, Jesus. it'd be very hard for even a government to kind of overtake that unless they start throwing a lot of money in which people could track that just because they could watch the new nodes appear and whatnot. Um, So I don't think that angle makes sense. Um, I guess I could kind of see the angle of, sure, the NSA invented it because everyone assumes Bitcoin's anonymous, and it's very far from anonymous. Um, I barely would use the word pseudonymous or whatever, um, just because if you know what you're looking for, you can track a transaction the entire history of everyone's transaction is publicly auditable. That's just by design because those mm-hmm. nodes are agreeing on what transactions happened. So if you have enough data points, you can and you figure out that 
Colin has this address he used last year and he used it 20 times. That's probably his per one of his personal addresses. And then five years in the future, I didn't even think about it. And I sent money from that address somewhere else. Mm -hmm. You kind of connect the dots and go, okay, we know Colin had this address at this time and he used this transaction. Colin might have sent money to this person. So obviously it's a lot of uh, connecting the dots and it's very complex kind of from that angle. But if, you know, um, large companies and large uh, data analytics and kind of connecting firms worked with that, there's a lot of data to work with and kind of... Um, I guess, figure out who you are if you really wanted to. Um, right. So from a high level, everyone goes, oh, yeah, it's Bitcoin. It's anonymous. No one knows. But if you actually are using it long enough and don't know really what you're doing, um, it's definitely a, you can. So so fears that people have, like, oh, terrorists are using it for, you know, to finance activities and things like that. That's not a realistic worry in that context because, I mean, people can, like you said, can track it down. And... Yeah, even the big websites, um, Coinbase is the way people most, or the number one way people buy and sell right now just because it's the easiest on-ramp. So anyone can sign up if they have a bank account. They link their name and all their, um, it's called KYC, know your customer. So you have mm -hmm. your name and all your address and your phone number and whatnot. So they can tie that. And they're already looking at the blockchain going, oh, we see you uh, bought drugs, you know, six months ago with the same address. We're going to close your account kind of thing. So, okay, so there's already, a lot of risk to doing that stuff. You yeah, don't so if you don't know out. what you're doing, it's definitely not as anonymous as people say. Um, okay. But, yeah, so a lot of companies are already investing in that. Um, I can't think of the name of the company off the top of my head, but there's already large firms that are starting to get into the auditing thing um, and trying to connect transactions. So presumably, you know, in five years, the IRS might, you know, hire that company to kind of go, okay, let's look who's – publicly avoiding trans or publicly avoiding paying taxes because those transactions once more data is available you can kind of see okay we know this address is Colin he had 30 million dollars at this time and now he only paid taxes on 30 grand or whatnot and they can kind of you know get more information that way right um so we're starting to see that come to fruition um that wasn't a big thing five years ago so it was a big turn for a lot of people um a few years ago Coinbase they were sued or not sued but they were um I believe subpoenaed by the IRS to kind of give up the records on all their customers okay. and they fought it in courts and it was kind of a neutral win or a neutral loss. Sorry. So they didn't have to give up information on everyone, but everyone, I think it was transacting more than 30 grand had, they had to give the information to the IRS. Okay. So those companies are already, and the government's are already working together kind of to, I guess, de anonymize or whatever, anonymize, um, and those transactions. So it's, yeah, again, it's people think it's private, but it's really not. Okay. Where, as far as Bitcoin goes, wh what do you think? And you said you don't really care. You're, you're in it. You know, you're just studying it and using it as a, as, a, as a point of profit, and it's a tool for you. But do you have any opinions or, or ideas of where you think it's going to go relative to you know hard currency? Is this is this really the future direction? It's going to be something like this, if yeah. not this coin itself. Yeah, I think um, some coins that don't exist yet kind of can solve new use cases we haven't even thought of. Um, the blockchain technology is very big and very open. As far as being like a Bitcoin maximalist, I'm not sure yet. Right now, it's you know far more adopted than anything else, but it's so easily replicated that besides the network effect of everyone using Bitcoin and knowing what Bitcoin is, it's still the same technology as a thousand other coins kind of thing because right. they all just copycat it's it. It's just a brand right now. It's a brand, yeah, a very okay. strong one. So it remains to be seen in the, over the next five, ten years, I'm not sure. But from a um, supply and demand thing, it still makes sense where there's only going to be that capped amount of coins. And even if you look at the market cap now, um, let's say $250 billion, whatever it is, that's nothing when you look at the money going into Forex, like the U.S. dollar and British pound conversions. And that's, you know, trillions are traded every day. So if Bitcoin, the quote-unquote quote, quote unquote thing is if Bitcoin would work out, it's going to have to be worth a heck of a lot more to get, you know, these institutions involved. Okay, so the large institutions aren't looking at it as seriously as as an investment or or, or or maybe hedge against the dollar right now. But is that a tool that some investors are using it at? Because you're just again, you're just using it to get some money, get out of it. But are people now adding it to portfolios and taking it as a serious like like you know, I was always told, you know, like gold and silver, precious metals are a good hedge against inflation, against you know currency. So as a, as a dollar drops, gold will theoretically always go up and vice versa are people using that now is, is that a smart strategy right now is it really just kind of touch and feel and it's hit or miss so they're not inversely correlated like when the dollar plummets gold goes up pretty much consistently uh -huh. um people kind of see it as yes it's in those alternative kind of things like precious metals but not quite to their i guess the liquidity just isn't there it's a small market so um, maybe in the future that's a potential or at least a portion, even like a 30, 20 percent hedge kind of thing would still be really good if the dollar crashes. Right. right okay. Um, right now, it's kind of been correlated for the last, I guess, two years um, where when the, um, I guess, legacy markets, you'd call them S&P and whatnot, when those crash, we saw 
similar crashes. So there's just not enough data points because, again, when you're comparing currencies that are hundreds of years old to Bitcoin, which is, you know, 10 years old, it's just not enough information. It's still an in infancy and in stages and things right. like that. So as, as, you know, I don't know how well you're aware of the history of investing, is that – is this similar as far as you know when when the when the market stock market was created and, and investing started happening and it became it became popular and people were learning how to do it and use it uh, is it kind of the same rate of growth is it is it have that that potential to latch on and be fifty years from now this is going to be the the thing you know like the the technology is kind of Pandora's box it was released it can't go back in the box the blockchain and how all that stuff runs right but that is i guess not tied to bitcoin it could be something else where someone thinks up something better or an improvement on it that doesn't need to be on bitcoin itself and right. they just you know the model that one is, takes off the but, model what has is what has the strength but so. the technology behind it yeah that's kind of um a game changer a lot of people far smarter than i um they were around for the internet boom and when the internet first came out people were like no one knows how to work these email addresses no one's going to know to type an <laughs> at sign every time you're trying to send someone information look where we are and now. then the internet now we send hundreds of emails a day whatnot um so i don't know if i would totally agree with that but i can see the mindset and just how they're kind of thinking down the road where it's kind of a paradigm shift of a new technology kind of coming in but it takes a lot longer for adoption than anyone expects okay. um for example, Coinbase was the easy, like I mentioned, Coinbase is the easiest on ramp for most people. Um, my grandma's never going to be able to use Coinbase. You know, there's just no way. Um, we're still, you know, so far off from mainstream adoption right now. It's we went from the people that started at the cryptography newsletter super nerds to kind of moving into okay, I kind of get basic finance and you know I want to throw some money at it. And now we're kind of moving into I guess um, early majority. I don't right. know exactly where we are on the scale, but. Um, yeah, we're just still so far off from mainstream adoption and just it being cookie cutter kind of, I want to buy this. Um, if blockchain technology is going to work in 20 years, we need websites where you're buying something, but you don't even need to know you're using the blockchain. It's just all running in the background or simultaneously. And that's just, you know, years off right now. Okay. What was I going to ask from there? Um, do, you, do you feel that it's... Uh, just just a gamble at this point though do you do you look every day like you you're confident and this is what's going to be do you do you feel like you're taking any kind of additional risk above any other areas of investing so do you have any fear i guess what i'm asking you are you fearful at all as far as fearful not really um i guess what was the start of that question sorry just just do you, is it does it feel like a gamble to you is oh it, yeah is it... the, right now the when it first was kind of growing the big use case was it was great for buying drugs on the Silk Road. That's kind right. of how in 2012, 2013, how people originally heard about it. It was just, you know, you could go to this dark web and buy your weed online and then, you know, it was a lot quicker and a lot safer and anyone could do it kind of thing. Um, we've since kind of expanded past that. Obviously, those sites got uh, or the main ones got shut down and new ones popped up. But um, but moving on from that, the new use case now is just speculation. So. Right now, people are going, oh, yeah, I want to make a quick buck. And that's kind of the number one reason people are buying these coins right now, rather than, you know, believing in the technology or having a use case where I can use this coin for this service kind of thing. Right. Um, we're not at that stage yet. It's purely, again, just the market is too new. It's in yeah. its infancy, and we just don't have, you know, does it, does people that make buying it, it to use it. Right. Does that, does that make it more profitable for you, do you think? Because there's less people involved in it, so you've got a little bit more flexibility. Or do you, do you want less people to be into it? Is it... Is it kind of give you more a bigger playing field so to speak i guess if that makes sense where is if it was more i guess cr across the board traded there would be more competition i guess is the word i'm looking for is that yeah at the end of the day um i think if the market gets big enough wall street's going to come in and the supercomputers are going to crush everyone just right. kind of like you know if you look at the chicago exchange back in the day all the floor traders that were waving their tickets and yelling at people are like, oh, no, computers aren't going to replace us. And if you look right. at it now, it's just a bunch of – it's a backdrop for the media, and all the floor <laughs> traders are wiped out or working and day trading from their computer at home. Right, because like um, you said, they're all they're all using just – the computers are just using straight analytics and just – Right, yeah, and they remove 100% of emotion. Instant instant moves, you know, whatever. Okay. And they can even do things at, you know, a millisecond response time and whatnot. So there's a big scandal um, of high-frequency um, trading where – Someone would order something. Let's say I want to buy this is just examples. I want to buy one dollar of the British um, one dollar worth of the British pound. A computer will see that, buy it for point nine 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 seven, and then sell it back to me for a dollar. And it pockets that point zero 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 three or whatever. 
and it just does that millions of times a day because their computers are super fast. They're super close to the, ex the brokers or the stock exchange or whatnot, and they can kind of just act as a middleman by having data faster than everyone else. So they were making you know hundreds of millions of dollars just kind of skimming publicly available information. Um, I think as markets mature, that's naturally the way it goes just for um, liquidity. The liquidity will improve, um, but again, we're just really far off from that, well, thankfully. Well well, speak because I mean, that's that's all areas of investing, right? I mean, just right, yep. the, com the computer stuff. So, does that make any sense whatsoever for uh, you know a, a person who wants to invest, you know, their some of their life savings in the market in some kind of way, whether it be Bitcoin or whatever, to even deal with a with like the traditional broker, the guy who who manages your portfolio, anything like that now, or is it just you just go to these computer houses now? It's like here's here's ten grand. I hope you don't lose it and make me some money. It depends on your goals. So if you're day trading, it's completely different. If you're right. looking at the markets, you're getting in and out of positions all the time, then that is going to get harder as time goes by in theory. If you're just buying and holding and saying, okay, Bitcoin's worth 3800 bucks today, I think um, when the supply drop or when the inflation drops in 2020 and it drops in half again in 2024, yeah, if I can hold that for six years in my retirement fund, there's a great chance it's going to be worth more than 3800 bucks. So if they're the long-term holding kind of side of things it's still you know a safe bet to throw a small very small portion of you know your portfolio into it um if you're day trading as a retail trader it it's tough i guess it's the same as jumping into forex if you don't know what you're doing there's majority of traders lose money just because there's a big learning curve to it and wall street's yeah. been doing it for years and are better than everyone what's the most you've ever lost at one time uh the first trade i made on bitfinex i lost 3700 bucks in about 40 seconds and then is that does that make you just ask all kind of you know, like internal life questions? Yeah, you when just you're wonder like, Holy fuck, what you, you were doing. You're like, okay, maybe I shouldn't have done that button or click that button. Um, right. It teaches you quick. When people ask, how do you get into this? How do you learn how to do this? Or when they want me to teach them or kind of, you know, tutor them, I guess. Um, the big thing I tell people is I see it as a college tuition. So rather than paying, you know, 15 grand a year for tuition, for a semester of tuition or whatever, just put that money aside and expect to lose it because. You can trade on paper all you want and go, okay, I would have bought Amazon at this price or bought Bitcoin at this price and sold here. Unless you have skin in the game, it's a completely different ballgame when you have all that emotion involved. Right. So a lot of it is just getting your ass kicked, learning what you did wrong, how to fix it, um, figuring out what trading style works for you. Some people can trade every 15 minutes on the chart where every 15 minutes they'll make a new candle and you can kind of see the price movement there. That's pretty quick. Some people do the one minute chart where it's just crazy and moving all the time and every one minute the data is different. And then I trade on the higher time frame, so like one and four hours. So it moves a little bit slower, but the um, I guess it's a little bit more calculated in my opinion. You just got to find what works for you. There's no right way to do it. You just got to find what's profitable, what you enjoy doing, and what's most importantly consistent. So, do you, now you say you like to stick with the numbers and things like that. So for you, for personal investing, whether it be Bitcoin or, and I'm assuming you've got money in other areas now beyond Bitcoin, uh, do you ever take any other kind of information in? Do you ever get like a hot tip or do you ever, you know, see something like a trend happen? Like, again, going back to the things in the media and like you, you've seen, well, I've seen this before and I know what X result is when A and B happens and things like that. Do you, does that ever come into play now? Yeah. When I first started, um, there was maybe a hundred altcoins and a new one would pop up every day. And so they would all have kind of one gimmick. And so if you got in on them early, it was kind of like, um, I guess you could say a Ponzi scheme, I guess, because the first person is going to tell his friends, we're going to tell their friends, or the, uh, multi-level marketing, sorry. Yeah. Um, and so they would all have some gimmicks. So one popular example was a coin called Nautilus Coin, and it was run by Brian Kelly, who's on CNBC. He's one of their news guys that does the financial markets. Okay. And so he was making his own altcoin as kind of an experiment, and so everyone naturally just assumed, um, this was in 2014, I believe, everyone naturally assumed, oh, he's going to you know, shill it on TV, and it's going to make a fortune because all right, these dumb right. people on TV are going to buy it. And so it was basically just a giant pump and dump off the, his brand name for jumping into it. Right. So something like that was where it's creative and you can kind of see, sure, it has potential to kind of explode from that direction. Even though the coin itself is worthless, there was no use case kind of thing. But from a you know just a trading perspective, it had great potential from that. And so you can kind of see that. Um, once, I guess it depends, once your portfolio size kind of grows, there's you have to kind of jump into what's more liquid. So since if you want to buy, you know, a hundred grand worth of Nautilus coin, there's just not that amount of money in it. You can, right. you could lose a hundred grand you know, instantly because you can't sell it. Um, so you'd have to be, you know, be playing with smaller amounts. So once, I guess it depends on your portfolio size, whether it's, you know, trading with a hundred bucks or trading with, you know, 30 grand or whatnot, kind of depending on those coins. So now there's 3000 coins, I think there's a lot more, um, there's more coming out every day. 
it's harder to kind of look and research all of them just because everyone's kind of coming and you're out saying with there's 3,000 different kinds of... That are known, yeah. yeah and there's yeah, a bunch yeah. that never even made those lists. So some guy launched it, ran it, and then no one picked it up. So they just okay. don't exist, for lack of a better phrase. Um, okay. And so, sure, oh, there's going to be diamonds in the rough on, on a bunch of those. There's going to be a lot of ones with good gimmicks or good use cases or a good team behind them. But it's a lot harder to kind of filter that information unless that's exactly what you're looking for. Um, for me personally, I enjoyed the trading side of things. So I don't like looking on the forums and researching coins and seeing why one is better than the other. So I kind of moved over the years towards the top 100 with the most volume and liquidity just because they're easier to get in and out of positions and you can do larger position sizes so you can make fewer trades and kind of position your size accordingly for how much you want to buy and sell. Okay. Again, it's all personal preference. There is still people making fortunes, looking up for those little diamonds and, you know, looking through a lot of crap, 99% of it's crap, and they can find that one, like the Nautilus coin um, example I used where it goes, oh, this might be shilled on TV kind of thing. And, you right. Know, there's, there's, there's better uh, alternatives now. Back then, being shilled on TV was a big thing. That was the yeah. biggest thing. Um, what would be like something uh, if you woke up and you, and you opened up the newspaper and what what would cause you to want to just liquidate out of everything, what 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 is like? It would be the biggest of red lights financially right now, just you know, whether it be something in the news cycle, be you know, uh, international affairs, war, or whatever. Is there any reason right now, like an investor who'd be listening, like, hey, this is this is my number one red light right here. This is when you need to adjust what you're doing and get out and and you know, liquefy, get some cash, and yeah, I guess it depends if you're talking temporarily or permanently, and never want to you know be burned and never want to enter crypto again or whatever market you're looking at. So, for an example, um, in I think it was 2015 or 2016, one of the top five largest exchanges was called Bitfinex, um, and they did a huge amount of volume every day. And um, I was on their website at the time, and when I refreshed, they took down the the page and posted that they'd been hacked, and more information will be provided soon. And knowing that they were managing, I don't I'm throwing a number in a hat again, but say well, they're managing $5 billion worth of people's funds, I knew the potential for that news to be really bad was right. very high. So I liquidated everything and just kind of waited until they posted the numbers because the chance of the price pumping on news like that is you know next to zero, and the chance of it plummeting, which it did um, historically, is very high. So that was just one example where it worked out. And then, of course, that made everyone on every other exchange where they could move their money. They wanted to panic sell, so it was a big run on the banks and... I think it crashed to $162 when I was at like 600 at the time. So it was a significant event. But the idea was it was just temporary. Yes, it sucks. Those people lost all their money and lost a lot of coins. But from a trading perspective, it was 162 or even 200 was way undervalued. So it offered, you know, um, trading entry there for this is a pretty good place to buy if you're kind of speculating from that perspective. Um, I guess to answer your question from the other side, if there was one thing that would just kind of be, okay, sell everything and get out. I'm not really sure if I'd have an answer i think having a small percentage kind of of your portfolio in this is still going to be smart for the long term if you just kind of see the supply and demand kind of situation involved with it what what about politics like and just use the most recent thing in the news cycle with trump and then you know the the, the, the Mueller report coming out and apparently he, he didn't do anything wrong how does that does, does did you see a change in investing patterns relative to the anticipation coming up to that and then the next day when oh, everything's fine now, or, or so we're supposed to believe or whatever, do, do you see changes based on things like that? Um, if you're a fundamental trader and looking at it from that perspective, yeah. So I just kind of remove as much motion as possible. So I'm purely just looking at the charts. And yes, they can be affected by big news like that. Because um, it's like somebody like you would, would, would capitalize that on the emotional traders. Like, it seems like that you would have that advantage because you don't have that emotional response so i'm would you in, in theory yeah, yeah but it's also if i'm looking at a chart that's been going up for you know three weeks and all of a sudden it retraced three weeks of uptrend in you know two hours yeah there's probably something involved with that but if you're trading just purely off the chart you'd have a running stop in theory and know okay this is the maximum amount of downside if it goes below this price then you cut your positions so even a big news event that would make the price plummet i still have all my numbers set where it would hit my levels of oh dang I got stopped out, I closed the position, but that was always part of the plan was, okay, I accounted for this. Um, I don't care if it you know, goes to zero or goes way back up. It's This is where my risk was. Because um, you can never know the upside risk. It's infinity, basically. Right. Um, you can only manage your downside risk, and that's the hardest part for traders to learn. It's just kind of where you need to cut losses. Do the, the, the people that fail the hardest, are they just the ones that are the, the gambling mentality then that are just... 
I, the I've risk takers seen, and all that who are, aren't are ignoring all the data that you you take you know you consider so valuable. Definitely, yeah. And I've seen a lot of examples where people will get, I guess, a winner's high where uh, okay. um, just to use number uh, making up numbers again as an example, someone will throw a hundred bucks at something and they double it, so they have two hundred. Then their next trade, they'll put in 200, and then they'll double that and make 400. And their next trade, they'll double that and make 800 instead of doing it proportionally with the percentage risk. So then they'll win five in a row and lose one, and they lost their whole, you know, 1600 bucks or whatever. And so they didn't actually make any money. So a hard part is just, yeah, managing that risk and kind of adapting. So in theory, they should do it percent-based where you're going to risk, you know, 2% of your portfolio every trade. So then if you make money, your 2% went up, but you're not going to be martingales, like doubling down kind of thing. Um. Uh, you, again, you're independent. You don't work for for anybody with this. Mm-hmm. Um, do people come to you? Do you invest for other people at this point in this market specifically? Is this? I get asked all the time, or if I want to start my own hedge fund and kind of collect money. Um, I just I've always preferred trading my own money. Um, it's a lot less stressful than trading other people's money, and then people you know sending you emails three times a week. Going, say, what I'd am be I calling doing? you what every day? Doing? Yeah, how's the money? How's my five dollars doing? Sir? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, and also just the regulatory side of things. You need a lot of licenses to manage other people's money. Um, you yeah. have to stay you know, up to date on compliance and all that. And um, what's very hard in crypto is custodianship. So um, insurance and custodianship are something that hasn't kind of landed yet. And that's going to be needed for a lot of like mutual or not sorry, mutual funds, but like financial advisors to get in and be able to put money in. They need to guarantee that these coins aren't going to get lost because the big um, – one of the designs of crypto and this blockchain technology is if you send someone money, it's not reversible. They can never get that money back because there's no central central party like PayPal. So every transaction is permanent. So they need to make sure if an exchange gets hacked, their money is insured or those coins are very secured in cold storage, not connected to the Internet, you know, in a secure facility or whatnot. And there's just not cheap, cost-effective ways to do that yet. Right now, um, companies are selling very secure facilities built into mountains, and they got cold storage and armed guards and all that. But at the end of the day, if they're charging 2% a year just to hold those coins, well, that's an extra 2% that they'd have to pass on to the customer. Right. And when hedge funds, normally they do what's called 2 and 20, where they'll charge 2% management fee. So whatever amount of money you give them, 2% per year just goes to pay their fees, and then 20% of potential profits. But if they're only charging 2% and the insuring people are charging 2%, they basically have to pay double just to get into cryptocurrency. And so it just doesn't make financial sense until those numbers get very low. Gotcha. Um, now, now we talked about, or you, you mentioned, you know, kind of the in the beginning of uh, Bitcoin and uh, its use on the dark web and the, and the crime angle from there. But are there actively scams happening now? I, 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 and again, honestly, I haven't read too deep into them. I'll see a story cross the line like this company lost X amount of money in in, in cryptocurrency, it just vanished or whatever. Is that stuff going on? And if so, how does that happen within these secure things? How are people losing their accounts? Or are are there traders who are taking advantage of people? Are they like, hey, yeah, come on into Bitcoin and give me a hundred grand, I'll make you rich? Is that happening at this stage? Oh, yeah. That that happens in every market. The problem is a lot of people will just go to get their news from mainstream media and, um, you know, those are heavily biased. So they are just going for clicks. Bloomberg actually pays their reporters a bonus every year if their articles get so many views and impressions because they're making a bunch on ads. So they're incentivized to promote Bloomberg. This is such a financial brand. Yeah, yeah, it's all public. Yep. Um, so they are incentivized to have clickbait, even if the articles are wrong or heavily opinionated, if people are talking about it, going, this article shit and they're linking it on Twitter and social media. That reporter doesn't care because he's going to hit his quota and get that bonus in theory. Right. So people are only hearing what the mainstream media is pushing. And so I guess one popular example was uh, ISIS is using Bitcoin to kind of move funds oh, yeah, around. Yeah, yeah, that was yeah. a thing a couple of years ago, probably still is. Um, and whether or not that's true, it was a small amount. Let's say, you know, 10 grand, which is nothing to these organizations over there. Right. Um, cash is still the number one way people launder money and that buy drugs, they do everything illegal with cash. But you don't see that wouldn't sell money on a website because no one would click on it because obviously cash is used to buy all these illegal things. But when they can put Bitcoin in front of it, then people have that targeted, you know, thought in their head of, oh, Bitcoin's bad because, you know, it was used for, you know, buy drugs or whatnot. So I guess it's fighting between what information you're getting and where. Right. But with that being said, there is the fact that these transactions aren't reversible. So it does kind of breed the thoughts that there's going to be a lot of scammers because if i get someone to send me money they don't get it back regardless if they send something with paypal 
you could dispute it and over a long period of time in theory hopefully paypal would side with you and refund your money um that's not the case in crypto so you, there is naturally a lot of people trying to take advantage of that all right so, so take me to let's go on the kind of like, like the personal end of things now so you just work out of your home is that what you're yep. how you do it mm-hmm so how, I'm just, I just try to visualize what it's like. You, I mean, you get up in the morning and you and you turn on your computer and you're just and you're watching these trades happen and you're you're just analyzing just based on knowledge and all that stuff. And right, you're so I'm in your boxer shorts, eating, drinking a cup of coffee. <laughs> That's in it. my Star Wars pajamas. Yep. Right. <laughs> so basically, I can start the day when I want. A lot of people, if you're trading forex, you have to be open for what's called the kill zone. So it would be like the New York open or when London opens or the Asian markets open. Those okay. are very big time periods and a lot of movements. Um, cryptocurrency is different. The majority of the trades trades are happening then. The the, the, the big the first... movements kind of start okay, then, yeah. yeah. Um, or because people have been waiting, you know, in theory overnight for let's say London opens at two a.m. here, so they're waiting, and then two a.m. hits, and then boom, there's a big movement in the markets because when there's opens, everyone can buy and sell what they planned for the last you know twelve hours and whatnot. So there's just naturally large movement there. Um, cryptocurrencies are different because the markets are twenty four seven, three sixty five, so you can get on any time and buy and sell. So right. it's just always active. So when we first started this conversation, um, it was you asked why, and I, one of the things I said was freedom. Um, I can kind of you know choose. Oh, I have a doctor's appointment today. Well, I'm not going to start work until you know noon, and no one's going to yell at me. I have no boss or anything like that. So it's got you know nice things like that. So if I want to start every day at 8 a.m., you definitely can, and you know have the discipline to do that. But you really can kind of set and choose your own hours and what you're looking for, and kind of go from there. And then with that being said, there's also the downside of there's zero job security. So right. with trading, you generally only hear the very good stories and the very bad stories, nothing in between. Um, I was fortunate enough to start start very young, so there was a lot less risk involved because even in a worst case scenario, if I didn't know risk management, I lost everything. It wouldn't have really you know, been detrimental to my world kind of thing. Um, I've also seen the opposite where people have you know four kids and they're married and it adds a lot of stress of, I need to make four grand this week to pay my bills. And then they're entering trades they shouldn't because right. they need to make money. And it kind of has a snowball effect of, you know, problems and just adds a lot of stress to you know, the marriage and everything. You so make worse decisions under pressure. And right. Yeah. And when like you're force entered trades, that's usually not a good trade. You want all the information available and to reduce risk as much as possible. So. Gotcha. Um, so when would, when did you become wealthy or successful from this? I mean, when did you just like say, Hey, this is, you know, was there a number or something like, hey, I'm going to need to do this full time. This needs to be my job. Did you, what was that day like? I mean, you don't have to give me exact numbers or anything like that, but it's like, okay, now I'm, I'm doing this. I'm on. What was that like? Yeah, for me, um, since I had the job at Medtronic right out of college, um, it was a pretty decent salary for right. just a recent grad. Um, so when I actually quit, I was probably doubling that so it wasn't an increase by you know a huge margin or a decrease it was kind of just similar right. um but it had obviously the potential for a lot more and i was young enough where i could take risks and kind of jump right into things full time and i knew if i'm doing this you know spending 20 hours a week on it if i can spend you know 40 50 what'll change i'll have more information and be able to make better trades so i guess to answer your question shortly it'd kind of be the one-to-one -one ratio of replacing it All right gotcha when, when did you buy the lambo uh, that was 2017. 2017. <laughs> or no, sorry, early 2018. Okay. Well, what was the, what did the market was there a, was there a substantial jump in the market when you when you basically doubled your salary? Did something was that? Um, or it never Bitcoin really just jumped, doubled. Crazy? It was kind of a parabolic effect. So okay. in 2017, um, I don't have a chart in front of me, but I think it was started around in January around 2000. I could be wrong on that one, but at the end of the year, November December, um, it tagged 20,000. So I mean, it went 10x in that entire year period. So it was a significant cr increase in 2017. We've seen the same pattern um, in 2013 when I first got in. Um, it usually goes up. It went from, I think, 100 bucks or 90 bucks to 11.75 back in 2013. Okay. And then it plummets 90% over time. And then it repeats the same kind of, um, I guess, reverse parabola shape. And we've kind of seen that three or four times if you look back, you know, the 10 year history of Bitcoin. Okay. So people are kind of, you know, posting that chart and going, okay, if we see the same pattern, then, you know, the next run is going to be 90 grand or whatever. And, you know, it's too early to say, and there's just not enough information yet, but we have seen the same pattern. So it's a big rush from two to 20 grand in 2017. And then 2018, we saw everyone that jumped in kind of was getting crushed because people bought it, you know, 19 grand, then it's going to drop to seven grand. And it was yeah, excruciating this year. And I think it hit like 3000 ish. So okay. big drop from 20 if you got in late. Right. Yeah. No kidding. Um, what about the people like you know the FCC and all that? Are do do you get scrutinized 
more so than the average person who just works like a regular job and things like that? Do you, do you, when you do your taxes and stuff, do you have to be extra careful? And what I'm, what I'm kind of getting at is like, is, is the government a little bit harder on people who are dealing and profiting and getting wealthy off of Bitcoin? Yeah, definitely. Um, I have to pay a lot more attention to my taxes than most people. Um, I pay, you know, a firm, a lot of money to kind of handle that just because it's so specific and, the problem is there isn't really perfect guidance yet. It's kind of submit your own, and if you do something wrong, we'll penalize you in the future. Oh, jeez. So you're kind of, you have to overdo it and prepare and make sure everything's perfect so that in five years, when an audit comes, you can go back and show the, exactly why you picked those and exactly where those numbers came from, those transactions and everything. So right now, a lot of people are just doing the lazy way where if you sell it back to cash, then they would consider that a taxable event. And then until then, they just have hidden Bitcoin. Um, that's not really a long-term solution, I don't think, for a lot of people, especially in the U.S., but we do see it that way. So there's, there's, there's no cap. Like, if you make, and, it's, and it stays in, in uh, Bitcoin, you you take 100000 and you make $10 million, as long as it stays within Bitcoin, it's not... It depends on where you made it to. So a lot of these uh, exchanges are offshore. Okay. So one um, very popular one, I think it's the number one right now for trading, is BitMEX, B-I-T-M-E-X. Okay. They're located in the Seychelles, so the middle of nowhere, like near Madagascar, I believe. So it's just an island country. There's, you know, they don't report any information to the U.S. And they, if you send them any information, it's going to take you know a week to get a reply. So they did that by design. That would be very hard to kind of communicate, kind of very offshore. And so they don't have any KYC. They all you, you can sign up with just an email address, basically. Um, and so they're very sketchy. And obviously, there's a lot of risk that they could just flee with all your money and whatnot. Right. But um, a lot of people trade there, and if you made a bunch of money there, it'd be very hard to prove if mm-hmm. you wanted to hide it. So, I mean, in theory, you could if you did well on these very sketchy exchanges. But the industry itself, um, pretty much um, BitMEX, to use that example again, they actually banned the U.S. Um, just because the CFTC is kind of getting on their ass finally. Okay. And so we're slowly seeing the uh, market and the, sorry, the industry mature where the SEC and the CFTC are getting involved. And so a lot of these exchanges are now requiring KYC, know your customers. So you have right. to put in your information and all that. So we're seeing a lot less people with just hidden money. But there's still a lot of early whales that made all their money from mining. So they just have you know immense amounts of Bitcoin tied to nothing and there's no traceability on those old transactions. Uh, I'm glad you said that because I, I wanted to ask about that. And again, I think I kind of know what that is, but explain to me what Bitcoin mining is and how does that work? Okay, I'm probably going to botch this one, so apologies if there's any miners out there. But uh, <laughs> the idea is, um, I used the word nodes earlier in our conversation, but um, it started out, the idea was we could run it on your computer. So mm-hmm. when Satoshi Nakamoto, that team or that person invented it, he would have his laptop and it'd be running the Bitcoin software. His computer would be one node, and he goes, if there's a million computers running Bitcoin, it's going to be a stronger network. Um, That was the original theory. So the computers are just doing very complex math to kind of figure out, to basically prove the theorem every 10 minutes that all those transactions exist. And there's got to be consensus. So it's got to be 51% of the network or more agree that all these transactions in the last 10 minutes happened. So... We've kind of moved towards uh, pooled mining, which I don't think Satoshi Nakamoto planned for, where rather than if I ran it on my computer at home, even though it's a very nice computer, a gaming computer, I would never win one of those blocks rewards just because there's so many supercomputers and huge networks of computers mining. So what people did is they decided to pool together. So 100,000 computers could all join what's called slush pool or just one example of a pool. And then slush would distribute those rewards to the 100,000 proportionately. And since they have 100,000 people on their network, they're going to be winning a lot of those 10-minute blocks. So then... Just by volume. Right? Just by volume. So right. it's, it's the same percentage chance. So you could run your computer for a year and a half and win one block and hope that you get that in the year and a half. There's no random variance of you winning or losing that block. Or you go to a pool where you know there's like a very high probability that you're going to get 12 blocks over that period of time and then split them proportionately. So it's the same amount of coins, but you don't have the variance risk. Is that still a viable way to, is there still mining going on that's, that's working and, and, or is it just so overran now at this point that there's no reason to get into it? I tell everyone to stay away from it. Um, I did it early on. Um, I actually it mined altcoins. That's when I first got in. Um, cause I had a gaming computer cause I was playing a lot of games back then. So I could mine altcoins with my graphics card. Um, the competition's gotten so high now that there's specialized software called ASICs, which it's basically a computer chip that does nothing except for mine Bitcoin. So those are wiping out graphics cards and CPUs and everything. So unless you're doing something at massive economies of scale where you have a huge warehouse, you have extremely cheap 
um, power and you're getting you know rebates from the government for promoting r and d of some sorts right. it's just not worth it it's easier just to buy and hold if you're kind of going from that perspective okay gotcha so uh we're getting close on your on your on your time limit here so let's let's go back to the to the the happy story of you <laughs> making money and this and and, and tell me, tell me, we got a Lambo in my driveway right now. It's the first time there's ever been a Lambo in my driveway. So you, you, you've, uh, you've set the record there for nicest car. Um, what, what kind of car is that? What kind of Lambo? That's is that? the 2015 um, Huracan. Oh, nice. Or Huracan if you're Italian. Right. So that, that, that your dream car, that's just what you wanted? Pretty much, yeah. I actually originally wanted a Lotus Elise, but I was too tall and too chubby for that one. So <laughs> I had to change my mind to the Lambo and upgrade. Well, the Lambo's pretty tight. I've set one before. They're, they're pretty tight as well, too. Mm-hmm. Not that that would be what would be stopping me from <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. that. So, so that, that, was, that, was, that was your first big like, cars extravagant are, purchase? Yeah, that was pretty much my only one. Cars are just a terrible investment. That was just purely for fun, for enjoyment. Yeah. Um, and it's just kind of, I guess, a reward for myself. Um, the better, I guess, results would be buying a home in cash or, you know, paying off um, families, mortgages and stuff like that, which, right. you know, financial freedom allows you to do. Um, that's obviously worth a lot more and um, a lot more valuable. So um, got my parents a condo and paid off my brother's mortgage. So that was a good feeling. Nice that for you. With family. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So it's, it's I guess, um, how how life changed? Because you, you're already making good money uh, with Medtronic. But I mean, is is it is making that kind of wealth? Has it has it just altered you? Where you just don't see your life the same as it was before that? You know, before where you've gotten to now, financially, does that make sense? I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's a bad question, but it, you get what I'm saying. It didn't change me a whole lot. Um, I still do the same things. I just kind of travel more. So I have, you know, right. I can be frivolous with, oh, you know, I can go on a random vacation to Ireland for St. Patty's Day. Sure, let's plan that ahead. Um, but aside from that, yeah, it hasn't really changed a whole lot outside of the car. Um, right. I don't need a lot of flashy things, even though it sounds weird. When we just mentioned the Lambo in the driveway. Right. Bright orange. But outside Lambo. of that one toy, yeah. <laughs> right. Um, really the same thing. So. Well, you, you said you also you know, do, as, as a good opportunities come, uh, a little venture capitalism or venture capitalist investing and things like that, people bringing you ideas and, and you investing in their ideas. I'm sure the amount of people who've came and approached you now is probably significantly higher now as you people who know you know you've you've made money and things like that is that a hardship that's hard to deal with you know I'm sure you got like lots of friends and family members even that would come to you with ideas and having to shut people down and things like that is that an ongoing struggle for you Yeah you get kind of thick skin pretty quick um I think most people understand that 99.9% of ideas are bad so it's just kind of figuring out the point one percent that kind of work or point one to one i guess percents that are kind of viable um and yeah you just it's a lot of time labor and not a lot of investment so it'll be a lot of reading you know project synopsis talking with the team kind of seeing if the idea makes sense looking at you know their financials the company history um their plan of action and kind of growth and how they've done so far and then it's just taking all that data and going okay can we extrapolate that and what's my risk here and is it worth throwing money at kind of thing I do a lot of the very high risk, very high reward stuff. So like seed round stuff. So very early on. Okay. Um, and it's just, again, it's all personal preference. Um, I wouldn't even say I'm amazing at it. It's just kind of, you know, getting better at it anyway. It's kind of how when I first started trading, um, didn't know what I was doing, got my ass kicked a lot, and then just kind of built on from that and then started, you know, adapting and using it as a college career. I'm kind of doing the same thing with... Uh, um, new investments now so jumping into i'm not jumping in but i'm like dabbling in you know look real estate options and venture capital and just kind of um going from there and starting small what is uh because i got some friends of mine who's who's going to be very eager to listen to this episode and he does like penny stock investing and just stuff like that a lot of experimental stuff very low level but is there any advice that you would give to people right now who have a you know a significant a significant amount of money enough to you know to do something things that they should get into, whether it be Bitcoin or is there maybe a top five things that people should be looking at right now? Um, yeah, if you're on the time horizon of you can throw money at something and it won't bother you if it goes up or down until, let's say, 2024, 2025, I think throwing a little bit at Bitcoin and Ethereum are decent kind of hedges into the cryptocurrency markets. Um, there's just, since it is so new, it's, the industry is only 10 years old, I would probably cap that at, say, you know, 2 to 3%, depending on your risk tolerance of your portfolio. Um, I think it is smart to throw some at it just because, again, the upside is immense and the downside is, you know, that 2% you threw in or whatnot. So the risk reward, in my opinion, is there just because I've been in the markets and following it for, you know, 
um, six years now, but it's, yeah, I would stick with just those two because there's 3,000 of them, but those are the two that kind of have withstood the test of time. Um, and if the technology does take off, those are probably still going to be around, even if they're, you know, trumped by a new technology that's better. It's still going to be, those still are, are going to be value or have value. Uh, you, you started out investing uh, actual dollars, right? Mm-hmm. Do you, and again, this is just to satisfy my uh, conspiratorial mind, do you, do you expect the dollar to, to survive and, and continue? Or do you, do you, if you were to really make a decision like, uh, I think it's going to be dead soon or it's going to crash or we're going to have a significant drop or, or devaluation of it, do you, do you feel that or worry about that at all? I'm 50-50. Um, my bias says I would love another 10-year bull run because everything's been going on for 10 years. Everyone looks like a genius in a bull run. You know, right. um, People are making hundreds of millions of dollars just throwing things into the S&P 500 and just waiting. Um, obviously that can't go on forever. If right. we look at, you know, 2008 and whatnot, and that was a huge detriment and people lost 40% of their wealth, like in, you know, that year or whatnot. Um, there is going to be a top. Um, I wouldn't just, since I do have, you know, 401k, I wouldn't mind another, you know, easy money for another five years right. and just kind of like what everyone else is doing and buy and hold. But, um, yeah, it does feel kind of teeter tottery here with the world markets and just kind of the dollar has been on such a strong run for so long that it's hard to say. Okay. Yeah. But thankfully, I'm not, or I'm, I guess, hedged enough where it's okay, um, and I'm a day trader, so I can kind of get in and out and make money on the intraday trading rather than I don't care what it does over the course of, you know, six months or whatnot. Um, well, I guess we'll make this one the last question. So what would you, and you can't, I guess you can't predict, or maybe you can, uh, if, the, if the dollar had a significant drop, it lost, you know, 20% value, a half value, whatever, uh, what would that do to you? Do you feel that would do to the uh, the Bitcoin holdings that you have or, or Bitcoin overall? Would you see a significant change then? Yeah, most recently was the 2018 kind of um, end of the year dump. Um, for cryptocurrency markets, it was the entire 2018 year. For the world markets, I believe it was the last six or seven months. I don't recall it was exactly. Having that, it was had like crazy growth that whole year, right? Yep. It was kind yeah, of... so all the tech stocks just exploded early in the year and then they fully retraced and then plummeted or whatnot. So, right. um if there is a huge drop in the dollar, I think it'll take all the markets with it temporarily. So, um, with the exception of um, really like every, all, every major market, silver. you think would yeah, still. I, think, I mean, I, I understand that you know previously the dollar was so much stronger, mm-hmm. but uh, there's been so many changes. I know, especially with with Russia and China and so forth. But it, it would really have that still that devastating effect. I think globally? it'd be universal. Yeah, um, there's just so many things tied to it, and there's just a lot of money behind it. So. Um, I guess it's too early to say, but we'll see. Okay. Don't All really right. have a good answer. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, I'm still terrified, so that's. Yeah. <laughs> I guess it is what it is. But yeah, but, for Bitcoin, for example, that'll plummet with it, I'm pretty sure. Really? Um, if there's a significant dollar dump, I don't see the sentiment going, okay, we need to move our money to safer things, and then people deciding Bitcoin. I think people will be panicking and kind of running home to their safety nets and getting all their money to be a run on the bank in every market temporarily. So right. long term, we might see that inverse relationship kind of like with gold, but it's not yet right now. Not right now. I'm investing in canned goods. That's uh, my market. There you go. Yep. Right <laughs> Get a bunker. Exactly. Exactly. Right. You're sitting on it. Yep. Uh, Colin, thank you for taking the time. It was very, very interesting learning uh, what I did from you. And uh, uh, yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having me. All right. Okay, there we go. That episode is in the books. And holy shit, do you do do you feel as I I feel a little less smarter and a little more poor after listening to that that conversation? Because <laughs> that's kind of I felt right. You know, it was, it it was only fortunate that he offered to give me a ride in the Lambo after the interview. Uh, because if not, I would have been just like banging my head against the wall. Like, why did I drop out of school? Why do I only have a GED? Why do I, you know, because that guy right there, uh, uh, is, is, <laughs> is doing it right. Right. He, he, uh, worked his ass off, uh, got a good education, self-educated himself on this obscure uh, cryptocurrency that very few people at the time of, of him getting into it understood it. And even now, most of us don't know. Even some of us pretend to know. Like, yeah, yeah I fucking know what Bitcoin is. It's, it's a magical currency uh, for, like, video games or something. I don't know, right? But no, this guy, he did it, right? He, he, he's living the dream, right? All the people that say they wish they would have got into it, they got into it. And all the ones that say they're going to make some money into it, out of it, he actually made money out of it, right? 
amazing story, right? I'm just, <laughs> it's amazing that I, it, it all turns back to me every time. I, 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 when I, I talk to people from all different levels and everything like that. And I'm like, and I always look at my own <laughs> failures. And that was a perfect example of like, fuck, I could have done that kind of, maybe, but whatever. I'm enjoying life. I love life, regardless if I don't have a Lamborghini. It is what it is. Uh, one more time, mention to the sponsors, uh, you know, simplewebsite.us, simplewebsite.us, not dot .com, simplewebsite.us. The place you need to go if you want some help, some free tips or tricks, or somebody to do it completely for you, uh, build a Squarespace website. They do all that shit. Okay. Uh, anything else? Uh, make sure you're rating and reviewing this podcast. Rate and review the podcast, especially you iTunes listeners. Come on now. That's the cost of, that's the price of admission. You just go there and you click five stars and you just write a simple sentence in the comment or uh, the review section. You just, the fucking episode's good. The podcast is good. Uh, whatever. Right? That's all you need to do. That's all you got to do. I'll be happy. The, the universe uh, will, will uh, uh, know more about the podcast by doing that, right? Because you will trigger whatever algorithms and fancy smart shit that I don't understand. And it helps the podcast, bottom line. Uh, human beings, uh, be good to each other. Please be good to each other. Uh, I, I can't record an episode without something tragic in, in the back of my mind, right? Uh, rappers getting done down in the street, horrible uh, natural disasters throughout the world, crazy shit going on. So let's, you know, let's make use of the time together and be good to each other, right? So who knows what the future holds as individuals, as a society, as a planet? Who knows where we're going at this point? No one fucking knows. No one does, right? If like if Colin was to like to to invest in this country, he would lose his ass <laughs> because I, I I don't see uh, even the planet. I don't I don't see it having any long term gains from this point. I don't know. Shit is just wild and fucking insane. But what we could do, regardless if it's a decade or a hundred years or a hundred minutes from now, the end of the world. Right, we could make use of that time by doing something positive for each other, for our loved ones, for strangers. Right, instead of being dicks to people, we could just say, "Hey, be friendly." Right? Why not do that with the rest of the time? Right? Here's a fun game to do. Right? This is how. I'm sorry to get into this at the end of the episode. This is just for the rare two or three people who actually listen to the end of these episodes when I start rambling. But do this game, okay? Go out to a grocery store or wherever and just randomly start talking to people, right? It fucking freaks people out now. Did you know that, right? Like, I'm, 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 I try to be friendly for the most part. I'll go out and uh, just see a random person. Hey, how you doing, right? Or I'll make a little joke about a situation that we're both in, in you know, standing, you know, we're both involved in standing in line at the bank or something like that. And I'll just start a conversation and it's fucking weird, it's fucking weird the reaction a lot of people have. And it's like, whoa, you're talking to me? You're communicating with me face to face? That's where we're at right now. Try it. I guarantee you 50% of the people you talk to at least will be like weirded out that you're even opening your mouth and to them and not typing something to them. You understand what I'm saying? You get what I'm saying? Go out and try some of that shit, right? And do, and do it positive when you do it. Don't say, hey, dick. Hey, motherfucker. Hey, fuck you and your Lamborghini. No, no, no. You say nice shit, right? You say nice shit like, hey, how you doing, sir? It's a beautiful Lamborghini. You deserve it, right? Try that shit. All right, guys. I love you guys. Uh, take care of yourselves. Spay new to your pets and uh, children, right? You want to keep the population down on both of those things, right? Uh, keep seeking the truth. No matter what the truth is uh, in your worldview, seek it, right? Smell it out. Snuff it out. Find that truth in life, no matter what it is, right? Even if like your truth is like you think you have a big dick, but you really don't have a big dick. It's like medium, mediocre, meh. Mm, mm. Like women, like when they see your dick, they they look disappointed in their face. They're like, nah, okay, fine, well, fuck, kind of. Whatever it is, find your truth. Yeah, that's a good message. I love you guys. Take care. Talk to you in the next episode. Bye-bye.